I'm ready for um, the NMR part of the IELTS core facility series. Um, it is a uh, custom here to present a little bit about the uh, NMR facility I'm, or each facility that is hosting a seminar. So I'm going to go quickly through the slides because most of you know what is going on. Um, so what we do, we do liquid state and high, uh, high resolution NMR on uh, small molecule polymers, biomolecules to study structure, dynamics, interactions, and function possibly. We do solid state NMR of small molecules, polymers, and biomolecules. Uh, as equipment goes, we have wide range of instruments from 500 to 700. The only problem is 700 is sickly and we are working on replacing it uh, with a new instrument and with uh, collaboration with the medical school. We are also thinking of getting 800 megahertz together. We would need all your support for that. Um, and as capabilities go, we, we can do, as I said, uh, protein ligand interactions, binding mode determination. We can use NMR as conformational assay to check for changes in dynamics of the protein. Uh, we can study dynamics of receptors, uh, follow chemical reactions. We can do polymer diffusion, the microstructure and morphology. Uh, we provide various kinds of services from the guided work and the doing work for you to independent work. We have a special NMR in drug discovery module that we've been uh, using for a while. Um, directors of the facility, I am the one of, of the biomole biomolecular NMR and Vago, who is the director of small molecule and polymer NMR. Uh, this is our address, and having said that, it is a pleasure to present Robert Williams, uh, who is a postdoc at um, Garage and Hebert Group. Uh, he has been doing some very interesting work on integration of um, NMR and mass spec to, stu to study glycoproteins, and now it will be more uh, wider application for polymer pro proteins and their complexes. Um, he got his bachelor's degree from Ohio Wesleyan University. After that, he went to industry, to pharma and food, uh, science industry to work in an uh, uh, analytical lab for four years. And after that, he went to University of Georgia to their PhD program. Uh, his advisors were Jonathan Amster and, uh, and uh, John Brestegrad. Um, he was, Robert was a fellow of the glycoscience training program. Uh, Grimes Family Distinguished Graduate Fellowship in Cancer Research. So uh, now he's working on uh, chaperones, I hope, <laughs> and in their, in their interactions using both MASPEC and NMR. Rob, I'll switch to your presentation. Thank you, Yasna, and thankful for this opportunity to talk to you guys today. And I'm uh, going to be speaking mostly about research I did during my PhD at the University of Georgia. So, um, so to begin, I'm not sure how familiar everyone is with glycoproteins, but they're an important class of biomolecule that's found primarily um, on the outside of cells. Um, and to emphasize that, I'm showing some electron micrographs here. So on the top one, we see this really fuzzy layer on the outside of this fibroblast cell. 
which is called the glycocalyx. And this is a pretty thick and um, busy area where there's lots of different types of carbohydrates and glycoconjugate that's attached to them. And if we could zoom in on this region, we might see something a little bit like this cartoon on the right, which is showing the full breadth of different um, carbohydrate and glycoconjugate um, rock species that are found in the cell. But for my talk today, I'm gonna to be focusing primarily on just a couple of these, for instance, glycoproteins with these N-linked glycans, which are branched carbohydrate post-translational modifications. And then also a second type of carbohydrate called heparin sulfate, which is a long linear polysaccharide that gets modified with different sulfates in a heterogeneous way. Um, and understanding these and all other kinds of carbohydrates and glycoconjugates is important for many um, biological processes, uh, including how cells communicate with one another, which can be important for tumor progression, but also how pathogens in, interact with our cells during infections. And so to an example of that is another micrograph, this time showing HIV virus viruses, which are studded with these kind of fuzzy looking smudges that are actually spike proteins, much like what COVID-19 has, which are really highly glycosylated, which can um, help them evade um, your immune system. So lots of important things to learn about glycoproteins. But glycoproteins come with some challenges for their study due to the extreme heterogeneity of the N-linked glycans. And so on the first level, this modification um, is variable in the sense that it may or may not occur, um, but there is an amino acid consensus sequence that's required for the modification where you have an asparagine that gets the glycan added on, followed by anything except a proline, and then either a serine or a threonine. And while you need this consensus to get modified, it's no guarantee that it will happen. And so there can be um, missed sites or sites that are partially occupied with the glycan. Um, but then the real um, source of heterogeneity comes even after it's been modified, where you could have a large variety of different carbohydrate structures at any single position. Um, and this is often referred to as micro heterogeneity. And to kind of give a brief example of that, I'm showing um, representative glycan structures for the three major classes. And so here, these are using a common um, cartoon nomenclature for, to emphasize the different monosaccharides. Um, but on the left, you can see this glycan is called a high mannose type, where it has mainly these green circles. Um, the more, most mature <clears throat> excuse me, and highly processed glycans are the complex type in the middle here, which have the widest variety of different monosaccharide residues um, on the termini, and then also the core can be modified as well. And then a variety of intermediate structures can exist, um, which are called hybrid, which is somewhere in between the two. And this is just a small uh, example of what could actually happen. We could have hundreds of different structures at a single place, potentially. Um, and the main point here, though, is that if you want to do some sort of structural biology analyses, it can be quite challenging because many of the preferred methods rely on you having a very pure homogeneous sample. Um, and so the approach I've been using during my PhD was a combination of two methods, nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy and also mass spectrometry, which I think for this type of work are, um, have complement each other quite well. And so on the NMR side of things, you can observe, directly observe atomic nuclei, which gives you very high resolution information on a very, but on a local scale in the vicinity of the atomic nuclei you're looking at. Um, it's also able to sense molecular motion and inform on dynamics of proteins in solution. But when you're observing the mixture, it can be kind of tricky to sort out which signals which correspond to different components. Um, however, on the other side, mass spec, um, fits in well because, for one, it has much lower sample requirements than MR, which makes it easy to add mass spec in um, as well. And then, especially in combination with um, another technique called ion mobility, which you can get some low resolution structural information that gives you a sense of the global three dimensional fold of the protein, which I'll go into a little bit more 
in a minute. Um, and then lastly, uh, mixtures are not a huge concern for mass spec because it's often the method of choice um, for looking at complex mixtures. Um, and so during my PhD, I developed several new tools to help expand methodology for glycoprotein uh, structural studies. Um, and one of the big ones that I'll be going into today was the development of new uh, techniques to assign the NMR signals when you're labeling your protein in a special way with sparse methyl, sparse methyl groups. Um, another one that I won't really be able to get into was I developed an experiment to measure something called residual dipolar couplings in those methyl groups. Um, but really the meat of my talk today is applying these methods and combining them with high mobility mass spectrometry to study the domain orientation of a heparin sulfate binding protein. And that protein is called roundabout one or robo one for short, which is found on the cell surface. It's a receptor protein, um, which is, contains a number of N glycosylation sites. Um, and its biological function is involved in signaling events that direct cell migration, especially during um, nerve system development, where they, in an embryo, they help define a process called midline crossing. Um, but these signaling events arise from the formation of a ternary signaling complex where three species come together, which includes um, a portion of robo-1, which is a pretty large multi-domain protein, but only these first two N-terminal immunoglobulin-like domains are involved in binding. They interact with a heparin sulfate, glycosaminoglycan, and also a single domain of a second glycoprotein that's secreted um, called SLIP2. And while it's known that all three of these species come to get, have to come together to initiate signaling events, it's not fully understood how this is propagated down to the cell to lead to downstream signal transduction um, and changes in cell growth. Um, but there is some structural information available in the literature. Um, in one study, they were able to crystallize these two domains of robo-1 in two different conformations. Um, in one, it's what I've called the linear conformation, where it's pretty straight orientation between these two domains. And there was a second more bent confirmation, which was an early sign that there's a fair amount of flexibility between the two domains of this part of the protein, which may be relevant um, for the complex formation and its biological activity. But well, really the story uh, for me personally started with some prior work that was performed in the Amster lab at University of Georgia where they were using a mass spectrometry approach to study robo-1 and its interaction with uh, ligosaccharides. And so this technique is called native mass spectrometry, which is a way of preparing samples for mass spec in such a way that it retains any non-covalent interactants, which can allow you to study protein ligand complexes. Um, and they were using a water synapt instrument, which includes an ion mobility device which you can kind of think of as gas phase electrophoresis, where it allows you to separate ions based on their charge, but more interestingly, by their shape. And to kind of give an idea of how that works, this is a crude diagram of a simple um, mobility device, where we have a drift chamber in the middle here that has a relatively high pressure of nitrogen gas. And ions will fly in from your ionization source over on the left, and in this example, there's two species, some big spheres and some little spheres. And all, everything gets pulled towards the, the exit by the effect of an electric field. But along the way, they're going to have collisions with the nitrogen gas. And the big things have more collisions with than small things. And so that creates kind of a drift force on these um, ions as they travel, which leads to them traveling at different speeds and you can separate them at the end. And then they go off towards a mass analyzer and you can also measure mass spectra um, for different things or inversely look at different conformation, different shapes for a single mass charge. And so using this approach, a predecessor in the Amster lab um, obtained some results that seem to indicate that heparin sulfate may be undergoing some sort of conformation change when it, or robo-1, is undergoing a confirmation change when it binds heparin sulfate. 
And so the key figure is shown in these two panels or on the top, this is an IM mobility arrival time distribution or this protein by itself, um, where we see a bimodal distribution in the, and where there's a smaller peak and a shorter drift time indicating some sort of more compact feature um, and a more abundant major peak and a longer uh, drift time, which corresponds to something more elongated. Um, and then the real kicker is on the bottom where now the relative abundance of these two peaks changes when you look at the protein in complex with a heparin sulfate hexasaccharide, where now we still see the two features, but with a much stronger compact form. Um, and to, we can make some general, uh, while this gives you very low air resolution information about the shape of the molecule, we can still present some models that match. And so on the right here, we're showing an elongated structure that could, that matches this along this slower peak, which is compatible with either of the X-ray crystal structures. And then here's a hypothetical model on the left um, where it's really kind of clamped down onto itself, um, consistent with the more compact confirmation. And so for um, a big goal of my PhD was to try to take this measurement and try and um, investigate it further in solution using NMR spectroscopy. And so the method, the approach we're using to do that is a little bit unorthodox. And so I'm gonna get into that uh, here where we're using a um, combination of a sparse isotope labeling protocol in combination with mammalian cell expression. And so a little background info is that most NMR, bio-NMR projects utilize expression in E. coli where you can feed the E. coli with carbon-13, carbon-nitrogen-15, and deuterium and uniformly label the protein at every position, which allows you to do some very powerful NMR experiments um, and assign all your signals and so on. But for studying glycoproteins, that may not be ideal because E. coli doesn't possess the biosynthetic machinery to add the glycan onto the protein, but also more complicated eukaryotic proteins may not express well in E. coli anyway. Um, so our solution in the Prescott lab was to work closely with um, Kelly Mormon's cell biology group at the University of Georgia, where they've developed um, an HEK cell-based overexpression system to recombinantly synthesize glycoprotein. And here we can introduce isotope labeling, but we are a little bit limited compared to E. coli um, because you have to give the cells the amino acid precursors. You can't just give them a single metabolic precursor like with the bacteria. And so that makes it extremely expensive to uniformly label something because all of the amino acids have to be isotope labeled. And if you want them deuterated, it just, it's really exorbitant. Um, and so instead of trying to do that, although it, it has been done in a few cases, um, the lab focused on a limited sparse labeling approach where we pick one, maybe two amino acids and they use those instead. Um, and initial efforts focused on amide nitrogen 15 labeling. But I tried in my work, I expanded this approach to include valine methyl labeling, or now the um, each methyl group is uh, carbon 13. And if you feed that to the cells, it gets incorporated into the protein and we can get nice spectra like this. Um, but we now we have a new challenge and we need a different, a new way of assigning the signals than what you might be able to do with the uniform labeling stuff, um, which we'll get to in a minute. But for the structural strategy for how we want to understand the domain orientation, we're using an approach based upon tagging Robo-1 with a paramagnetic landmine. And there's a few different ways people do this in literature, but the one we've gravitated towards is by an altered protein construct where you insert a uh, peptide sequence that has uh, been engineered originally at MIT to bind lanthanide ions with high affinity. Uh, and the advantage of getting these lanthanides into the protein is that they introduce perturbations in your NMR spectra in a number of different ways that give you a lot of structural information. And for this sparse labeling approach, we're a little limited in the number of data points we can measure um, or structural restraints. And so this really helps uh, expand the amount of information you're able to get out. 
And so there's three main different effects you can measure from that. Um, the most important for today is called pseudo contact shift, but we'll come back to that later. But for now, I just, when I designed this, I wanted to make sure the lamp guide was oriented in a position roughly in between the two domains so that we would get, um, we could later get from it would report on the relative orientation of these two based on how far different regions are with the lamp guide. Um, and so having designed that, it looks great in the MD simulation, but we need to actually make sure it works in reality too. Um, so this is showing some of the distances, which are still promising for, um, for later analysis. And so I turn back to the native mass spec technique where now we can do a titration um, and just watch the peaks change as we add in lutetium chloride as just a model lanthanide ion. And sure enough, when we get to one equivalent of lutetium, we start to see a second heavier peak up here that corresponds to the mass of the ion when you um, account for the charge. And then it levels off a little bit higher, but we reason this was still, uh, might, doesn't look saturated, but at NMR levels would work in much higher concentrations. So that wasn't a concern. The second aspect I wanted to verify was that the function of the protein hadn't been perturbed by this um, modification by adding this loop in. And so for, for, for this purpose, the, we were looking at, was it still able to bind heparin sulfate? Um, and so the model oligosaccharide I used in my studies is a drug called Erixtra that, is, um, that you can buy, which it makes it really convenient to use. Um, but it's a pentasaccharide with a highly sulfated um, glycosamine of glycan um, derivative, essentially. Um, and so now I'm showing a similar native mass spectrum, but now we've zoomed out a bit. So now it's apparent that there's lots of peaks, which are just different glycoforms of this protein. There's one glycosylation site on this molecule. Um, but when we add in one equivalent of Erixtra, we see a bunch of new peaks appear, which correspond to the addition of this Erixtra molecule, indicating that yes, it can still bind on the ion or uh, the gag. And also, this is an ion mobility um, data set as well. So we can make sure that we haven't changed that initial confirmation change that kind of started this whole project in motion. And sure enough, we see the same bimodal distribution without Erixtra. And then a similar change occurs when we look at the robo Erixtra complex. Or now there's a compact form that's more prominent. With all that in hand, we've validated that this looks like a good model system and we haven't broken the protein with our lanthanide loop. So now we can proceed with the NMR experiments. And so now we get back to the challenges of assigning the different NMR peaks. And so this is one slide that covers the bulk of my PhD work, but um, then the um, Prestigard lab has come up with this software that we call assign SLP for assign sparsely labeled protein, which helps you do this assignment. And the general idea is there are a number of NMR observables that we can predict from a structure, like an X-ray crystal structure, um, which include chemical shifts, which are the actual peak positions. Other labs have developed algorithms to predict those. Um, RDCs can be predicted just straight from the coordinates, NOEs as well. And then the, this had been implemented in earlier versions, but my contribution here was to add in um, the paramagnetic effects as well, in particular, pseudo contact shifts and relaxation enhancements. And then with these predictions in hand, you can also perform NMR experiments to actually measure these on your sample. And then the idea is if you compare the two um, and search for the best agreement, just vary the assignments and look for the best agreement between experiment and prediction to find um, what is the optimal match. And that gives you your residence assignment. Um, and so algorithmically, if you wanted to look at these all, all possible assignments, that'd be a pretty bad idea um, because this doesn't scale very well. And for robo, in this case, there are 38 peaks, which gives you a number that's larger than the, all the stars in the universe. Um, so instead, um, this uses a genetic algorithm which can um, kind of is, is, um, can optimize uh, the assignment without having to check them all one by one, basically. Um, and it's also uh, pretty good at finding global minima. Um, 
And then the big change is that this used to be kind of a mismatch of uh, MATLAB scripts and C++ code and stuff that didn't play together very well. And I um, kind of rewrote it to all be one cohesive program with a graphical user interface. Um, just an example, this is the screen that first pops up when you open it um, with nice buttons for some of the different functions. And then um, this is all available on the Press Card Lab website and should also be available on the NMR Box platform for people to use if they so desire. And so with this software, I was able to then apply it to my own project and assign the resonances of robo, uh, the valine res methylene resonances of robo one. But um, due to the number, it would still require a few tweaks. So in this case, there's 19 valines, which gives you the 38 methyls altogether. Uh, which was a little too challenging straight up. So we had to chop it up a little bit and narrow it down. And so one way to do that was um, dissecting the two domains. And so we prepared a single domain construct with just the IG1 portion. And then we can compare that with the full length construct, see which peak disappeared and can sort them between the two domains that way. And then a second level of constraining things um, so we can actually use some NMR experiments to figure out which valines are in the same, or which methyls are in the same valine residue. And so for that, I use an experiment called epoxy, which allows you to correlate each methyl with the intervening beta proton um, and thereby link them together. And then also in some favorable cases, I saw the alpha proton signal as well and realize that these are two extra chemical shifts that we can plug into that assignment routine where now we're predicting alpha, beta, gamma um, and measuring them as well. Um, and then finally, we wanted to just make sure this was working by some limited mutagenesis where we chose six um, valines spread throughout the structure, changing to isoleucine. So now they're not labeled anymore and we can observe which peak disappears and assign it that way. And so these heat maps are the output you get from this assigned SLP program, where these blue squares are showing you how the peaks you measure, which just go from one to 18 on this top plot, um, course are assigned to different valines. And so peak four in this case is assigned to valine 71, methyl one, and so on and so forth. And then the circles are showing what the mutagenesis experiment um, revealed, this true assignment was. Um, and the good news here is that the blue squares are all inside each of these circles, indicating that they agree with one another. So it's finding the correct assignment. Um, and then a similar story is happening down here where we have some more mutagenesis experiments um, that confirm the assignment from my software. <laughs> and so with the assignments in hand, now we can get onto the real interesting um, science here and look at how um, this protein interacts with the gag. And so first off, we just wanted to titrate um, the Arixtra molecule in to make sure that we have um, a high percentage of the complex, even though the interaction is fairly weak. Um, and so you can track this by watching the methyl peaks move as you add in increasing amounts of your ligand. And so these two, valine 165 and an alanine 166 um, were observed to move. Um, we can map these onto the structure, which shows us roughly the vicinity of the binding site, um, which is in this hinge region in between the two domains. And this is consistent with prior research on where um, different heparin sulfate um, molecules bound to this protein. So that's good. And then the um, actual way I was looking at the structural um, domain or orientation analysis was using these type of data called a pseudo context shift. And so this is um, induced by the paramagnetic lanthanide ion where you have, I think you can see there's a little line ion in the diagram here that's bound by the lanthanide binding loop. And these funny shapes around it are kind of showing me how these pseudo context shifts change with position. And what, what this really means is we collect two spectra with, with no ion and with dysprosium in this case. And you see the peaks will move along a diagonal line from where they start. And they can go either up or down. Um, and then we just compare the two, subtract, and that gives us the magnitude of the shift, um, which is related to the orientation based on this kind of scary looking equation. 
Um, but the, the key points is that there's a distance dependence, but also an angular dependence, which is kind of highlighted by this, this colorful shape. Um, Robert, why does the ALO 166 show up in the T13 spectrum? That's a great question. I, I forgot to uh, talk about this. So the um, uh, one of my coworkers figured out that if you feed the cells um, carbon-13 labeled glucose, then it'll label the glycan and alanine. Um, and so we use that in addition to valine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. And then this um, should be pretty sensitive to the, the domain orientation because you can see right now, this is the first domain. If that were to move relative to the other domain, it could fall into this red lobe and, or in this blue lobe. And those are different directions of the shift. So whether it's going, this is a positive shift going down to the left or a negative shift goes up to the right. Uh, and so the actual measurements are shown here, just focusing on the IG1 domain because that's not, um, connected to the lanthanide. So that should show the biggest effect. Um, when we combine these four different data sets to get two pseudo contact shifts measurements, and this bar plot is showing the two different sets. And you can see that they are, there is a change occurring in pretty much all of the pseudo contact shift measurements, but it's, um, which, which is good. That's what you expect if it was a big global change as opposed to some local change. But the the changes are relatively small and the sign of the shift hasn't changed. These are all positive shifts. So it's probably not a really dramatic um, change in the structure. And so to analyze this data, uh, we don't need to get into the math too much, but basically you can plug this into some equations um, and then assess the quality by a parameter called a Q score, which is sort of like a measurement of the fit. Um, and then we do that using only the data from the second domain that has the length line attached to it. And then we can make models where I move the other domain around into lots of different orientations and then try to see what matches the best. Where we can kind of think of these plots here, this is a correlation plot where measurements is X and um, this predicted value based on our fit is the Y, and the better they agree, the smaller this Q value should be. So we can use that as a readout of how well it's fitting our structures. Um, and then I set up a grid search where we just rotate the IG1 domain a little bit in three different angles, um, and we can plot these, make these contour plots showing the effect of Q um, on these different rotations um, where we find this kind of island, this region of low Q or the best agreement. And to actually see what this looks like in terms of the structure, I'm showing what we started from, which was derived from my MD simulation, um, superimposed with the 20 best models from the grid search. And we see that there's a pretty different orientation between all of these relative to where we started, but there's also a range of different orientations that fit the data quite well, um, suggesting that there may be some inherent flexibility so Rob, there's a, it's a torsion that you can have either this or this. Yeah, the the way I coded it is it could it could um, re reorient basically any any which way, except it was still uh, there was still a hinge in between the domains, so it wouldn't it wouldn't do anything nonsensical like right. turn around while the other domain stays still. So it, you could kind of think of like it's like a, a hemisphere it can move around, mm -hmm. but yeah, there's a little bit of I think of it like an twisting 70, but don't mind me. <laughs> um, I mean, it's kind of like uh, air, airplane pilots, you know, you have pitch, yaw, and roll. It's kind of like that, or just there's three different angles you can rotate that. Um, so. so, do you think it's, it's averaging, or there's an ensemble of states, or? Can you tell from your modeling? Um, so I there's so we're prob, we're measuring the average, uh, but there is, there is there does seem to be um, a distribution of slightly different conformations. Like it's it's not a rigid structure, um, but it's also it's not um, 
becoming really compact. So this is the same analysis now. First, we were looking at data without a RICSTRA. Now we're looking at it with the RICSTRA and it, it hasn't changed a bunch, but it is slightly different where now we have kind of a tighter clumping of these top 20 um, structures, um, more narrow region in this, uh, this uh, metric space. Um, which seems to suggest that it might there might be a more rigid conformational ensemble when it binds um, Erixtra. And you can kind of um, rationalize that by the fact that the gag binds near the hinge region, which could limit its ability to move. So if you had chemical shift perturbation for the binding, right. how would that map onto that picture then? Is what you're saying it would be across the hinge? It would be, yeah. Yeah, that was an earlier slide. Right here. That, so these okay. two blue residues are the the, al the secret alanine um, and this valine were perturbed um, the most. There, there's like one or two more that move a little bit, but that's those are the biggest. <coughs> and so based on this analysis, um, we did not confirm the gas phase result from the ion mobility experiment, sadly. Um, where it does not appear to be adopting this kind of compact species, at least not in a significantly large amount that we would observe it um, in solution. But it does seem likely that there's, um, there's inherent flexibility that leads to an equilibrium of states and that a Rickstra appears to shift that toward a narrower distribution um, that makes the molecule more rigid. Um, and unfortunately, while ion mobility, I think, is still a useful method, in this case, it looked like we had some artifactual gas phase compaction, which has, has been observed in some other um, flexible molecules like antibodies. Um, so overall, um, I, hope, I hope I've given you a sense that this sparse labeling approach to NMR can help expand the range of proteins and other biomolecules we can look at. Um, and look at things that you can express in E. coli. Um, the paramagnetic tags are really useful and there are other ways of adding them chemically where you don't have to change the amino acid sequence. Um, and then lastly, in this case, it didn't really work out, but um, the native mass spectrometry by itself is useful and, and ion mobility can be useful for other systems. Um, and like looking forward, right, with what I showed you, we did need to have that X-ray crystal structure to make our initial predictions to help interpret our NMR data. But in the future, that may not be necessary, especially with the revolution in prediction um, based around AlphaFold 2, where you could use that as your starting point and help at least validate that it's a good model and hopefully you can do more stuff as well. Um, and so that's the end of my talk. So I just want to acknowledge my PhD advisors, John Amster and Jim Prestigard, uh, as well as Kelly Mormon's lab who made all the protein samples. Um, and thank you guys for your kind attention.